Hello, and welcome to AMAT 362, Probability for Statistics at UAlbany. This is lecture 15. So I want to remind you what happened last time in lecture 14, where we talked about the all-important central limit theorem. which is essentially the method for computing things like uh, the binomial probability in a given range when n is large. So this is good for computing uh, binomial uh, probabilities for large n. Um, but again, remember that uh, the binomial is just a sum of Bernoulli's, but that more generally x1 through xn can be any random variable. And that was the sort of grown up version of the central limit theorem. There's one more result I want to tell you about, um, which essentially says that if I want to compute Uh, the probability that Sn uh, is exactly equal to some value A uh, for, you know, again, Sn equal x1 plus xn. Each of these are going to be uh, iid random variables with um, mean mu and standard deviation sigma, then I actually have a, a better point-wise formula than just using the sort of continuity correction where I subtract um, and add a half on each of the two limits. Uh, this looks something like uh, as follows. So it's lowercase v of a minus n times mu divided by the square root of n sigma squared. Sigma squared just being the variance. But then I need to divide this again on the outside after I've evaluated phi uh, by that same factor of n times sigma squared. Uh, now, again, you want to make sure to note that this right here, maybe I'll just do this the sort of the pointwise formula. because it tells you about the behavior of this distribution when you're looking at a single point or a single value. Um, and here we're also assuming each xi are integer valued. And in particular, that the difference between any two possible values has a greatest common denominator of, uh, of one. Um, so just think of this as like rolling a die and, and things like this. Um, so again, uh, just as a, as a quick remark, so uh, phi here is the probability density function of the unit normal. So it's the PDF for normal 0, 1. So in particular, if you were to graph this function, you would get this sort of bell curve phenomenon. So this is actually the, the graph of phi. Uh, but what we considered uh, last time was picking a value, let's say little z, and then looking at the lower tail probability. So this is what we call capital phi of z. So it's very important to remember that those two things are different. All right, so today we're going to, um, well, maybe let me just show you a quick application of this. Um, 
Imagine I, I flip a coin. Two hundred times. Oh, suppose I want to know what's the probability I get exactly one hundred heads. So now, if I want to do the probability that S two hundred equals one hundred, well, this is the same thing as phi times one hundred minus well a half times. 200 ends up just being 100. So the numerator here is zero. And then what I've got here in the in the bottom, if I work it out, looks something like a uh, square root of 50. Um, because it's a uh, 200 times a fourth times a fourth, or uh, 200 times a half times a half, which is 200 divided by four. No. And again, all of this is um, uh, an approximation. And so I need to remember to again divide by square root of 50 because um, square root of n times sigma squared in this case equals uh, 200 times a half times a half. All right. All right. Well, so obviously this is phi of zero up top. Um, and if you if you go ahead and do this, do the math here, you'll end up seeing this looks like uh, one over square root of two pi times 50, um, which ends up equaling about 5.64%. Uh, All right, and this, this answer actually, I think ends up being better than if you tried using the continuity correction to just look at uh, minus a half, minus a hundred. Um, we'll end up just doing minus a half divided by square root of 50 and then capital fee of uh, plus a half divided by square root of 50. Um, but I, I leave that for you to, to check. Um, maybe we'll just do one more uh, example. Suppose I want to estimate that the, the probability that out of 200 flips, I get exactly 90 heads. So this is a, a full 10 flips below. Then I need to do phi of 90 minus 100 uh, divided by square root of 50. Again, divided by square root of 50. And, and here, I need to go ahead and use the, uh, again, this is an approximation. Uh, this ends up equaling 1 over square root of 50 times 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the minus uh, minus 10 divided by square root of 50 squared uh, times a half. Uh, so if you do that math out, you get a 100 divided by 50, which is 2. And so those 2 in, ends up canceling. And so we get exactly uh, the answer that we had before, which looks something like this, times e to the minus 1. Uh, and when you do that calculation, this is approximately uh, 2.07%. All right, well, so this was an appropriate segue because today's topic is all about approximations that involve E. Ahead and all right, you know, e is such a special number, it's a 2.71, so on, so on, so forth. Um, and just like pi, it tends to show up in, in really surprising places. So, in order to uh, get a, an example of this, I want to um, start with one of the original questions that we, we started our class with, which is the birthday problem. But I want to go ahead and, and consider um, a slightly more interesting variation on, on the birthday problem that we're all used to. Um, so let's instead take a little trip. And, and today we're going to go on a trip to Mars. Uh, and even though Perseverance, uh, NASA's latest rover, is just uh, strutting around on the surface of, uh, of Mars looking for, for signs of life, uh, uh, they don't actually realize that 
not too far away, there's an underground bunker where uh, a bunch of Martians are at a party. Um, and of course, they being intelligent beings are, uh, are just like us and that we occasionally like puzzles or riddles and in this case, math. Um, and so we're interested in the question of, suppose we got 40 Martians in a room, what's the probability that at least two of them uh, share the same birthday? So I'm gonna call this the, uh, the Martian birthday problem. That'd be a sort of section one of today. So, of course, what is a what is a day? And remember, this is something that Martians, like Earthlings, celebrate once a year. So we need a little bit of information. Um, so I'll tell you that a Martian year is six hundred and sixty nine uh, Martian days. Which makes sense because it's uh, farther from the sun than, than the earth is, so it's got a longer trip to make when it, it goes around. Um, and so the question we're interested in is what's the probability that in a room of 40 Martians at least two share the same uh, birthday. Well, again, the way we approach this problem is by considering the complement. Um, and just for the, the sake of abstraction so that we can uh, then compare with what happens on Earth and having a nice uh, plug and play formula, um, let's go ahead and introduce some, some variables. So let D be the number of days in a year, uh, which for uh, Mars is 669. And then let's let N equal 40. That's our, our number of, of people slash Martians. So the probability of no repeated birthdays Well, if we go to the first person, um, they can have any birthday. So that's a, that's a D out of D uh, possible days. But now we want the next person to not repeat the first person's, uh, or first Martian's birthday. And similarly, we want the, the third person not to have the uh, birthday that was in common with any of the previous two. And then we do that all the way down to uh, D minus N minus one, where, where N is 40 in our case. So that's all well and good, but again, you can imagine this little cumbersome to calculate. I have to do this 40 times and I've got this annoying 669 I've got to subtract from. And uh, um, so let's, let's kind of massage this formula a little bit. Uh, so obviously D over D is the same thing as one. And I'm gonna rewrite the second term a little more su suggestively. Um, and I hope that you agree that all of these simplifications are the same. Um, here I'm just dividing into D into the first slot and then uh, splitting apart the fraction and making that just minus what's left. Now, I wanna recall a, uh, a little fact which you may have forgotten from calculus, uh, which is that um, E to the X can be viewed as this infinite series. So on and so forth, all the way up through x to the, you know, n, n factorial, so on and so forth. And so now we're going to uh, do a trick, which is something that physicists are really good at, and you know, I think anyone who works with uh, real data and you give quick answers should be good at, which is let's go ahead and, and make some approximations. So in particular, if we look at uh, e to the minus x, then this looks like one minus x. Uh, plus higher order terms. Um, 
uh, higher order terms. Um, but we can we can just go ahead and, and use this then, which says that something like e to the minus x is approximately equal to one minus x. And this is a good approximation for small x. In particular, x that are, are much less than one, uh, which is definitely the case for one over 669, which is this first term, and will probably still be true up to, you know, 39 over 669, which is this uh, going to be this last term here. All right, so let's go ahead and make this substitution. Um, so we now have that our probability of no repeated birthdays uh, can also be expressed as, uh, well, e to the uh, minus zero, that's the same thing as one, times e to the minus one over d, times e to the minus two over d, all the way down to e to the minus n minus one over d. So if I remember that when I've got a common base, I can always uh, add together the exponents. So this ends up equaling e to the minus uh, one over d plus, well, let me just go ahead and keep calling it minus two over d, minus three over d, all the way up through minus n minus one over d. And so this should, uh, this should ideally um, remind you of something, which was namely a formula that we used when we computed the expectation of the roll of an insided dice. I had to sum the numbers one through n. So let's go ahead and, and use the fact that uh, one plus two plus three plus all the way up through n minus one is equal to um, n minus one times n divided by two. And so what that tells me is that the probability of no repeated birthdays, you know, repeats from uh, n out of d possibilities Uh, well, this is well approximated by um, e to the minus n minus 1 times n divided by 2 times d. And in, indeed, sometimes we just go ahead and approximate this further to say this is the same thing as e to the minus n squared divided by 2d. So this is a really handy approximation because um, we can go ahead and and just sort of plug in um, our values for n and d to get estimations of the probability of no common birthdays. So for, uh, let's see, we have our Martian year, which was 669 days, and we had uh, n equals 40 people. If I look at e to the minus uh, n squared over 2d, um, this ends up working out to be about um, e to uh, all right minus forty squared divided by uh, two times six hundred sixty nine uh, ends up equaling about thirty one point one six percent. Now that means that the probability of at least to common birthdays amongst our Martians should be something like uh, 60, uh, 8 .8 or 69% uh, probability. So better than half, actually. Uh, now, just just in case you want to, you need to remember back um, for uh, Earthlings, where D was equal to three sixty five, it's number of days in a year, and again we have forty people in a room. Um, you know, 
approximately the max capacity of, of AMAT 362 um, uh, on a given year, uh, we get a slightly different formula. So we have the same thing where it's you know, minus 40 squared, but we have a slightly uh, uh, lower denominator. Um, so this ends up equaling uh, two times uh, 365. And if you plug this in, you get about uh, e to the, um, oh, this ends up equaling about 11.8%, uh, which in particular tells you that at least two uh, common birthdays turns out to be about 88%. Uh, uh, So this is uh, for Mars, and this is for Earth. Which, which makes sense. There are fewer possibilities for birthdays on Earth, so that means if you have 40 people, um, there should be uh, more likely uh, for there to be at least a repeat, uh, at least one repeat. Um, I want to use this formula to also uh, give you a sort of general rule of thumb. So suppose your question was, you know, you went into, um, you know, I am now a Martian professor and I'm lecturing to my group of Martian students. Uh, and I want to try to, um, you know, bet that at least two people have the same Martian birthday. How many Martian students do I need in order to guarantee that I have at least a 50% chance that two will share the same birthday? So how large does n need to be to get probability of uh, at least two common birthdays uh, to be greater than 50%? I mean, here we already beat it with 40. Um, so now we want to go lower. Uh, so if, if, I, uh, if I go ahead and just try to treat this problem using my formula, uh, the answer comes really quickly from using this approximation because it says that I want you know, e to the minus n squared over 2d, uh, which is the probability of no two common uh, birthdays, or at least an approximation to that. I want that to be less than a half which if I, if I take natural log of both sides, uh, works out to being n squared divided by 2d uh, needs to be less than uh, minus ln of two. And so if you multiply by minus one, the inequality flips. And so then you end up getting something like uh, n squared needs to be greater than uh, two times d times the natural log of two or in particular that n needs to be greater than the square root of 2d times the natural log of two. Um, now, what does that work out to in our, in our case here? Uh, well, let's just go ahead and plug it in. I actually uh, didn't, didn't yes calculate that, so I'll just pull it up here. So if I wanna take sqrt of two times 669 times, uh, uh, natural log of, of two. I get uh, that n needs to be greater than, this is uh, 30.45. So as long as n is greater than 31, you know, I, I'm in business. So, so again, we could have done this trick with at least 30 students. Huh? And I think on earth, it works out to be about 23 students. Um, so again, that also shows you that uh, things go by the square root, which is sort of another phenomenon that appears in, uh, in uh, last lecture. So I want to say one last uh, uh, thing, which is that this method is actually quite general. Um, so you can apply this method
to a situation where you know you've got a hat. Uh, looks like look, looks like old Abe Lincoln's hat. We've got little tickets in here, um, and we imagine that we've got uh, D tickets enabled one through D. Now, if you draw with replacement, what's the probability that by the nth draw, you've seen uh, so these were tickets numbered one through D. You've seen the same number come up at least twice. So for example, I like I pick tickets and then you know, I see a 30 a 42 and then I pick some more and I end up seeing 42 again. Uh, now, not conditioning that it has to be exactly 42, but just any number repeating twice when I'm sampling with replacement from this population of D tickets. Um, you can see that this is exactly like the birthday problem. I'm just um, got N people and I'm sampling with replacement their birthdays because, you know, again, it doesn't steal a birthday away once one person has it. You know? uh, it does when we're trying to calculate uh, the probability of just having no common ones, but, but either way, the answer to this is, if I call this probability of at least two on the nth draw, well, this can be well approximated by the same thing. So one minus e to the minus um, uh, n times n minus one over 2d. Um, but again, you can approximate this, uh, this top by minus n squared over 2d. Either one's fine. So that's the exponent. So we get one minus e to the minus n squared over 2d. So both are fine approximations. Um, maybe one slightly tighter, but. All right, so, so again, there all we were using was um, kind of something like this analog in physics of the small angle approximation where you know sine of x is approximately x. Here we're saying that uh, 1 minus x is approximately e to the minus x. Um, so let's, let's use that same kind of idea to look at another uh, really important class of, of approximations. Um, and this is, this is called the uh, uh, Poisson approximation to the binomial. Okay, and so, yeah, I'm very happy that I've got this blue wave here uh, because I've got little fish jumping out of the water. Those fish are so happy. And maybe you'll get the joke because um, Poisson is the French word for, for fish. Um, all right, so, uh, but it was also the name of a, of a, of a mathematician. Um, and it's likely that um, just as many English names have um, some sort of occupation built into their name, like, uh, like Smith, someone who was a, a Smith, uh, then uh, a, maybe a fisherman was, a, was uh, someone who was named with Poisson. So perhaps this person, this mathematician, was the descendant of fishermen. Um, but let me just go ahead and state up front what is the, the punchline of this, uh, which is um, for even large n, um, if p is very close to 0, um, this is like our probability of success then the CLT uh, is a poor approximation. Uh, 
Um, and instead, you want to use a slightly different formula that still involves e, but not this like e to the minus uh, z squared that we had after you do this, the z transform. Uh, instead, what we have is something like this. So the probability that the number of successes out of k tries, uh, which we know is normally equal to uh, n choose k, p to the k, q to the n minus k. This ends up being very well approximated by uh, lambda to the k divided by k factorial e to the minus lambda, where lambda is equal to n times p. Um, and, and I'm also going to remark that this right here was our, our probability mass function for the binomial uh, distribution, uh, which we might call bn pk, indicate that we try n times the probability of success on any given try is p, um, and then we're trying to look at the probability of there being k successes. So this is a super, super useful formula. Um, All right, so uh, let me give you a little bit of intuition for, for where this formula comes from. And in fact, it goes back to some of the approximations we were just making, um, namely that when I have one minus X, I can approximate that as E to the minus X. Uh, so this is gonna be a quick aside on why this is true. You know, some of you are just happy to take the formula and apply it, but uh, maybe some of you want to have at least some plausibility argument for, for why this is true. So let's consider the extreme case, which is that we want to count the probability of zero successes out of n tries. Um, so we remember that this is the same thing as uh, q to the n, which is the same thing as 1 minus p to the n. That means I have to fail n times in a row. There's no deviation from that. So again, for small p, I can think of 1 minus p as uh, e to the minus p raised to the n. Now, again, we're going to use this factor lambda um, and we're going to call lambda equal to n times p. Um, and the reason why we do this is because very often um, we're going to approximate problems where uh, maybe we need to take some space and chunk it up into n pieces, um, but then um, p ends up being proportional to how small our pieces were. Uh, just like think of a dartboard, if I wanted to estimate the probability of landing in a certain corner, well, first I could do big chunks. And then now the probability of hitting a given square, if it's a large square, is large. Um, uh, but then I want to chop that up into smaller pieces, but then sum over all those little pieces. Uh, all this is to say that this is now the same thing as e to the minus lambda. Um, and so now we've got the situation where e to the minus lambda already appears um, as our approximation for the probability that uh, there are no successes that have been tries. I'll give you a little bit more uh, of a hint. Uh, so the proof basically proceeds by induction. And this is not something you have to, uh, you know, repeat for an exam or anything. I just want to let you know that if you consider the ratio of binomial probabilities, um, where Oops, I'm going to pick a smaller eraser size. Um, so we first note that the ratio of these BNPK by BNK minus one, so that's the ratio of how much more likely is it that you'll succeed, have K successes rather than K minus one successes. Um, if you do a simplification by just using that factorial formula, you'll get something like uh, n minus k plus 1 over k. Um, 
and this is all times p over one minus p. Again, that makes sense because you have you have one fewer success um, in the in the bottom, um, but one more failure. So that's your q. Um, but anyhow, if if you rearrange this, you end up getting and you use also lambda equals n times p. Uh, this ends up giving you lambda minus k minus one times p over k times q. Now, of course, if p is approximately zero, q is then approximately one. So then I can approximate this by saying that this ends up being the same thing as lambda over k. So in particular, once I've made this first observation that um, uh, e to the minus or lambda approximates Sn equals zero. So then, so if the probability of Sn equals zero is well approximated by e to the minus lambda, then the probability that Sn equals one, so you think of this as our k equals one, equals uh, lambda times e to the minus lambda. And the probability that Sn equals two is then well approximated by uh, lambda over two, because now k equals two, if I use this above ratio, times uh, lambda e to the minus lambda which ends up equaling lambda squared over two factorial e to the minus lambda. And so now repeat that for, for any Sn equals k, and you'll see where that lambda the k over k factorial um, uh, coefficient comes from. All right, so let's go ahead and just get down to applications. So So happy that our fish is uh, is here. Um, all right, so to kind of get at that same idea of what happens when I'm trying to maybe subdivide a space to then approximate the probability of of a certain um, point appearing in a certain space and time, um, we end up getting get up the following. So um, here's a historical example. So we've got. Nazis uh, bombing London. Again, this was a real, real site of concern. Um, and as you can imagine, and as is famous in examples such as Alan Turing, um, you know, Her Majesty's government was very interested in, in uh, recruiting mathematicians and scientists to uh, to help fight in the war effort against against the uh, the Axis powers. Um, who were sort of led by, by, by the Nazis and their regime. Um, but nevertheless, the Luftwaffe was, was brutal. Um, and let's imagine we're in the, in the following situation where I've got, um, uh, just to make this grid a little more fine. So one, two, three. And so this ends up being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Maybe one more. Um, and then I can have you know, there's long blocks and short blocks. Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, and ten. And I can just erase this top here. And say say we're worried about you know the Luftwaffe um, um, who've got their sort of fighter jets and they're they're dropping bombs as they pass over London. Um, we're interested in what's the probability that a bomb hits a, a particular block, and let's say that that 
uh, block is maybe where, where, where 10 Downing Street is or some other important uh, government building. Uh, so this is where uh, 10 Downing Street is. Um, now, again, the way I've approximated this is uh, I uh, broke up spatially my region into a 10 by 10 grid. So even if I just make a naive assumption that, um, that the Luftwaffe are dropping bombs uniformly at random over this, over this 10 by 10 city block, um, then I have the probability uh, P. So if uh, assume bombs dropped uniformly at random, then I've got something like uh, P, which is the probability of a success, success here actually being bad thing. It's the bombing of uh, the probability that uh, uh, 10 Downing Street block is bombed equals one out of 100, because um, we got a, a 10 by 10 grid. This is, a, this is 10 here as well. So let's try to be optimistic and say, what's the probability that if Nazis drop 400 bombs over this area uniformly at random, what's the probability that the block containing 10 Downing Street's not hit? So this is the same thing as asking, what's the probability that uh, S400, so we have 400 bombs, that's our N, and this was already our P, what's the probability that this is equal to zero? Well, this is uh, the same thing as uh, e, or it's well approximated by e to the minus lambda, which is equal to e to the minus uh, four. So let me make that clear, four, because uh, lambda equals n times p is equal to four. That turns out to be something like 1.8%. Uh, uh, Now let's go ahead and, and compare that with what the, the true probability should be if I were just using um, the exact formula. So the exact probability would be So this is the same thing as looking at uh, Bn, which was 400, uh, P equals one out of 100, and I'm looking at K equals zero. Well, it's the same thing as uh, one minus one over 100. Uh, so this means you have to not hit 400 times. Same thing as 0.99 raised to the 400, uh, which ends up equaling 1.7%. Uh, uh, which if you compare to the answer we just got, uh, with e to the minus four, that's pretty dang close. Um, so you can, of course, go go deeper here and you can see where it'd be harder. So if I didn't change it, what's the probability that three bombs hit? Again, we can hope that maybe it doesn't hit exactly the one building on that block that contains, uh, uh, that is 10 Downing Street three bombs hit, well, the exact would be, exact answer, well, that'd be, well, I have 400, I need to choose three of them to hit. The probability of each of those three hitting is uh, uh, 0 0.01 raised to the three, and then I need to have uh, 397 misses. All right, I encourage you to try to put that in your calculator. Um, but you might find it uh, difficult to compute. So instead, I'll content myself with the, uh, the Poisson approximation. It says that this is the same thing as uh, uh, four to the third, three factorial, e to the minus four. So I just take this uh, 
uh, 1.8% that I got earlier, and I multiply by this four to the third divided by six, uh, which ends up equaling something like 19.5%. All right. And indeed, this actually, this distribution, this Poisson distribution has expectation, which corresponds to, um, well, it almost looks like the mode um, uh, ends up being around whatever lambda is, um, which makes sense. Uh, N times P is the expectation. Uh, let's do one more application. Um, and so this is uh, going to be typos in a book. So let's imagine that um, you know this is sort of back in the older days where you know things weren't electronically printed, but instead you had uh, you know actual uh, carved little metal letters that were pressing with ink and having to like make their impression on paper. Um, let's say that there is a a, a typo um, occurs approximately once out of every thousand words. So this means that a, the probability that a given word has a typo is, is one out of a thousand. That's our P. So this is implies that P equals one out of a thousand. Now we're looking at a, a page on a book has 200 words. Let's try to compute the probability that there's at least one typo. So the question is, what's the probability of at least one typo on a page? And I mean, I just like pick a page at random and then I ask, for this page, what's the probability that there's a, a type, at least one typo on this page? Um, of course, if it's a really long book, then you know, number of pages, um, you'll be certain that there's a, probably a typo on, on at least one page. Uh, but anyhow, um, let's use the Poisson approximation. And again, what we do is we take one minus the probability of, of no typos i.e. Sn equals zero. And again, n here is now equal to uh, 200. And so this is the same thing as, uh, or ends up being approximately equal to one minus e to the minus lambda. Now what's lambda? Uh, and again, this might seem like a lot of math, but at the end of the day, all you need to do when you're using the Poisson formula is figure out what's lambda, what's k. Uh, and in this case, lambda is gonna be n times p. So lambda equals n times p, which is uh, 200 times one out of a thousand, which is a uh, which is 0.2 or 20 percent. So this is the same thing as one minus e to the minus 0.2, which uh, if I plug this in a calculator gives me something like 0.818, which tells me that roughly uh, 18. 0.2% uh, probability that there is at least one typo. Probability of at least one. All right, so uh, we're gonna see variations on this Poisson formula as we move forward into this class, but uh, for now, this is one of the last really meaningful applications of, of how to approximate the binomial distribution. Uh, so to review, when we have n is large and technically for arbitrary p, um, we have a central limit theorem approximation. But we also know that when p is very small, or maybe p is somehow a function of n, um, just like in this Nazi bombing example, if I wanted to figure out probability of bombing a particular place, I could have subdivided further, and then the probability of any given event uh, would have gone down proportional to the number of, of blocks. Um, um, here I had 100 blocks, but if I subdivided further into 20 by 20 grid um, of the same area, then the block that constitutes Downing Street would then have four blocks, um, but the probability of 
hitting any given square, p would have gone down by, by a fourth. So that's an example where p was a function of n. So the, in the case where uh, uh, n times p uh, tends to some constant lambda as n gets large, then you use the Poisson approximation instead, which is actually a very nice formula. It just involves lambda the k over k factorial divided by e to the minus lambda. Um, all right, so that's it for today. Um, I look forward to seeing you in class soon.